to Bay to Bay, the TV channel of District 4, where Toastmasters from San Francisco Bay to Monterey Bay polish their skills in public speaking in front of the TV cameras. Hello, I'm Svetlana Danilova, your host, and I'm pretty excited about today's episode. It would be slightly different compared with what was before. Why? Because all speakers are the members of Advanced Club in San Francisco. It's Evening Stars. Our members are winners of many competitions in public speaking. And we use Evening Stars as a lab where we try and test different techniques. And we will bring whatever works to our home club. I'm very excited about this show, and you should be too because you're absolutely guaranteed to know something you never seen before and to have fun. We will have a prepared speech, speech tonight and the speech will be delivered by John McKnight. John is advanced speaker, but advanced speaker of working on CC manual every year and that's exactly the time for John. His project is number two. Uh, organize your speech and the title of his speech is my favorite creatures ladies and gentlemen I'm giving you John McKnight as a biologist and an avid outdoorsman I've had the opportunity to study and learn about many of the fine creatures that inhabit our big beautiful planet fellow Toastmasters honored guests Tonight, I'm going to share with you two of my favorites. First, I'm going to tell you a little bit about their biology. And then I'm going to tell you about what makes them special to me and why I choose them among the most favorite creatures on the planet in my book. Finally, I'm going to conclude tonight by telling you where you can go see them right here in the Bay Area. The first is a well-recognized creature, the monarch butterfly, also known as the milkweed butterfly. It's known as this because the larvae or caterpillars will only eat the milkweed plant. If you want to have monarch butterflies in your backyard, plant milkweed. The mature cat butterfly will plant this larva on the bottom side of a milkweed leaf. Within a few days, the eggs hatch and out come little baby caterpillars. And right away, they take to eating. And they eat a lot. A grown caterpillar is over 2,700 times heavier than it was when it was hatched. Within a few weeks, the caterpillar matures and immediately begins the process of attaching itself to the bottom of the leaf and forming a cocoon around itself. Then begins the magnificent process of transforming into a butterfly. This takes no more than two weeks. As the new butterfly emerges, it dries its wings and then goes and joins its colony. Monarch butterflies do everything in their colonies. They breed, they eat, and they migrate, and it is their propensity for travel that ranks them, in my mind, as one of the most amazing creatures on the planet. At just four and a half inches across, these light, delicate creatures, twice a year, take out of themselves along migration routes from their northern summer habitats down to their winter overwinter spots. They travel anywhere from hundreds to thousands of miles. Imagine something so small navigating precisely every year right back to the very grove where its colony habitates each year. Now this should be magnificent enough, but there's a whole other twist to it. You see, monarchs only live two to three months. At the longest, a non-breeding monarch might last six months. So tell me, how does a colony start up here, travel several months down to the south, and return to the exact same grove when not one butterfly on that return trip has ever been there? This is one of the great questions in biology and is why I think the monarchs are absolutely one of the most amazing creatures on the planet. My second favorite, a face only a mother could love. <laughs> this is the bull, a bull elephant seal. Bull, a bull elephant seal, this elephant seal, weighs about 6,000 pounds and is over 16 feet long. Full-grown adult male can grow as big as 20-some feet and be up to 11,000 pounds. 
these creatures, the females, are about a third of the weight, though both of them reaching maturity at age five, only the males can really reproduce at about age seven after they've grown large enough to defend a harem. Every year, the, the colonies of elephant seals gather at one of the beaches where they are originally from. Like salmon, they return to their original nest. The difference is the rest of the time, the rest of the year, when the elephant seals are not on their beach, they're out in the ocean. They're very solitary creatures. They spend the vast majority of their time out in the big open oceans. And what are they doing? They're eating. The majority of the time they're eating sharks and skates and small squids or whatever their local fauna exists out on the open ocean. I like the solitary nature of such a large beast out in the water. But it's what they do out there with all this free time that really fascinates me. You see, the elephant seals are some of the most amazing divers in the world. They're rivaled only by whales. On average, an elephant seal dives somewhere between 200 to 1,000 feet on any given dive while hunting. Where males are clocked in at going as deep as 5,000 feet, females have been clocked in at over 7,000 feet on two-hour dives. I want you to realize that mankind doesn't get to 7,000 feet. Our military submarines don't go there. 7,000 feet is about as diff easy to get to as going to the moon. I have to think these amazing creatures are spending time in some kind of wonderful meditative state as they go for these long, deep dives. But what's very interesting is that they also, to when, as soon as they approach any depth, even over a few hundred feet, their lungs collapse. So all the air in their body has been pushed out. So how do they survive? Their bodies are adapted for diving. Their hemoglobin, their blood cells, are unique in that they can hold on to more oxygen than ours can. They also release the oxygen slower so they can survive longer on that single breath hold. Their bodies also adapt. As soon as they go in for a deep dive, their heart rate lowers. And their body only forces blood to vital organs. These amazing creatures, when you see them on the shore, lumber about and look rather awkward. But part of the reason is their bodies aren't used to being in our gravity. They're used to living at high pressure. And when they come up on shore, you'll see them laboring with their breath. And that's partly because they're used to being compressed and they don't know what to do with their large body mass on the ground. They're absolutely a wonder to behold. And with that, let me tell you where it is you can see them. Right now, both these species are down in their winter spots. The seals are out to sea. But in the spring, the elephant seals will return locally to either Point Reyes at Chimney Rock, or if you were to travel south near Santa Cruz to Año Nuevo, bring some good binoculars. It'll be worth the view. For monarchs, one of the best places in the world is to see them not far from here, down near Monterey and Pacific Grove. Or if you want to go to Marin, you'll be able to see them in Mill Valley, Stinson Beach or anywhere out near Point Reyes. Fellow Toastmasters, I encourage you, get outdoors. Come see two of my favorite creatures in their natural habitats. And if perhaps what I've told you today doesn't draw you out to see them, I encourage you to go out and find your own favorites. Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, John. Evolution at Evening Stars is done in a different fashion. Instead of assigning somebody as an evaluator for every speaker, our Toastmaster <coughs> assigned randomly members on the meeting to provide the evaluation without any preparation. Are you interested to see how it goes in life? All right. We will start evaluation from Dmitry. John, what a delightful subject. Butterflies, seals. It sounds like I gave you the idea of this speech. It fits my interests so well. Absolutely delightful. And the rest of the evaluators will tell you a lot more about how beautiful your speech was. And I'll focus on giving you a few ideas. Seals and butterflies. There's so much that, they, that, that is different between them. And yet, I'm sure there's something that, there is, that they have in common. You had two major parts to your speech, and it would be really interesting to me if you managed to find connections or contrasts between these two storylines as you were developing, as, as, as you're developing your narrative. Also, it would have been 
wonderful to see a little, a little more enthusiasm, a childlike fascination. Imagine that we're all two-year-olds or three-year-olds, and our attention span is about five seconds. And for some of us, it really is. <laughs> you can be more animated. You can create a lot more emotional of an, of an emotional roller coaster. And I think for this topic, for this speech, and for your personality, it would take it to a completely different level. Thank you very much, Mrs. Toastmaster. Thank you, Dmitry. <laughs> Dmitry's evaluation are very philosophical every time. The next evaluator will be Scott Guerin. Thank you, John, very much for your speech. I enjoyed it very much. I felt like I was watching the Nature Channel on TV. You can almost without fail turn on the Nature Channel and find any number of documentaries that are really very well put together and engaging. And I felt like that. I felt compelled to really listen to what you were saying and really hang on every word. And what I found most enjoyable about the speech itself is that you took subjects that were relatively familiar to both my, I'm, for myself, and I'm assuming the rest of the audience as well, and made them very interesting. Living in San Francisco, not infrequently will I find out that a building that I've been passing in front of for years has a whole very intriguing history that I knew nothing about. And I felt like that was much the case in the speech today. I grew up with monarch butterflies. I see seals down at Pier 39. And you brought a whole new insight and understanding to these otherwise very familiar creatures. And so I felt compelled and really drawn into your speech and was really enjoyed it very much as a result. I I think your pacing was really good. I felt, much like a documentarian, you had a very even, keeled pace all throughout the speech that was very supportive to the subject that you were trying to present. And further, even at the outset, what I enjoyed is the fact that you did the very tried and true, I'm going to tell them what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell them, and then I told them what I told you. I mean, you made it very clear. We, we had no confusion as to where the ball was going. You made it very clear as to what it was you were talking about. Now, on a couple of occasions during the speech itself, I noticed that you stumbled a little bit. And that's, that's understandable. That's human nature. I've stumbled a bit during this evaluation. But what that says to me is that there's a greater need for internalization of the subject so that it doesn't become a matter of trying to say the right thing, but just owning the subject so deeply that you're just up there and you're just going to tell them exactly what you're thinking and feeling. I enjoyed the speech very much. I would love to hear more speeches like this from you, John. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Scott. Evaluation by Scott, even better than the best advice you could get from the lawyer. <laughs> the next evaluator will be Joel. John, thank you for your wonderful speech. It actually hit particularly close to home since I grew up on the central coast of California. And I grew up going to San Simeon to see the elephant seals. And I grew up going to the monarch groves. Actually, someone in my family works as a docent in the monarch grove. And it brought me back to the time last year when I was in a monarch grove that is not public. And it was raining monarchs. They were just coming out of the trees and raining almost to the ground. So thank you for allowing me to relive that. I, uh, something that I thought you did particularly well was you didn't just give us the surface fluff. You didn't just give us, monarchs are butterflies, they travel thousands of miles, wow. You gave us, did you know this? Did you know that they deposit the larva on the bottom side of the milkweed bush? For all of the examples you gave, there were a lot of really interesting and unique and scientific bits of information that I haven't even heard from the docent member of my family. So thank you for expanding my knowledge about both the monarchs and the elephant seals. That said, I think there were almost too many facts. I got lost trying to keep track of which fact we were going on. I think some way to work around that would be to, to choose one example or choose one fact and dive a little bit deeper. You did that particularly well with the elephant seals and talking about the deep diving. I thought that was fascinating and that you brought back the example of the Navy doesn't even go down that deep in submarines really put it into context for me. So fewer examples would have made it easier for me to follow. And I think the big miss for this speech, if there is any, would be that you didn't honk like an elephant seal, <laughs> because that's truly their signature. Thank hey. you for your wonderful speech. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Jim.
I really appreciate every simple advice I got from Joe when he's doing my evaluation. Our next evaluator will be Kristen. John, I think what I appreciated most about your speech is the giddy excitement that I felt when you started talking about animals. <clears throat> kind of brought me back to when I was a little child going on field trips to the zoo or learning interesting things in school that I just don't really get in my adult life anymore. The first thing I want to point out that I really like what you did was uh, g the ghosting. So when you talked about the monarch butterfly, you were in one space, and then when you went on to talk about the elephant seal, you moved to another part of the stage. And as a very spatial person, that's great for me because it really helps me cement in my brain what you were talking about in which place of the stage. I want to focus on the emotional part of this speech for me. The best part was when you told us, for both animals, why they were so cool. The butterflies were so cool because they fly back to the same exact orchard every single year without ever having been there. That's amazing. I couldn't do that. I can't go to the same restaurant five times without getting lost. <laughs> and same for the elephant seal. You told us why they are so cool. They can dive 7,000 feet in two hours. That's, you know, we don't even have the human power. Not even our U United States military can do something that amazing. That blew my mind. That was my wow factor. And I would have liked to have heard that earlier on. The other facts you gave about the animals were very interesting. Um, but I, I would have preferred you just cut right to the chase of why these animals are just so gosh darn cool and then go on to tell us, hey, you're in luck because they're here right in the Bay Area and you can go on to see them. Um, but really, I want to thank you for taking me back to that feeling of being a little kid again. Thanks, John. Thanks, Thank you, Kristen. Only what, one word uh, I need to describe Kristen's evaluation technique, sincerity. Our next evaluator will be Tony. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you John. It's going to be hard to say something that hasn't been said already. I'm going to talk about the content, the form, and the delivery of the speech. The content, absolutely wonderful. You had all the facts with you, and you talked about it like you really know the subject. You've been studying the subject before you present it to us. And you did some comparison, like the elephant seal going uh, that deep, like 10,000 feet, it's like us going to the moon. That gets the point. We, we, we understand how formidable that is. Uh, then there is uh, the organization of the speech, the form. And uh, the beginning, the, the body of the speech, and the conclusion. And here I'm thinking that the beginning of the speech, the introduction, could be a lot stronger. Maybe start with a picture of the elephant seal with a little butterfly on its nose. And, and then, you know, and, and start from there, something totally different. Not, I'm a biologist, let me tell you everything. That's, that's cool, but it's not as cool as something like, the contrast between the elephant seal and the butterfly. You have something that's very fragile out there and something that's really like a school bus. And the contrast between the two is absolutely wonderful. And then the, the, the common thing is the very myth mysterious things they can do, like migrating, going very deep, mm -hmm. and so on. The other thing is the delivery uh, of the speech. And, and here I felt you did very well, you, you're there, you know what you're talking about, and you're talking directly to us. I felt at some point you were not as comfortable uh, as some other moments. And I realized that the moments where you were very comfortable were the moments where your body is more engaged, where you're making like bigger gestures and, and talking to us like that. You were more engaged than you were like kind of like into yourself talking about the subject. And one thing to remember is that when you're out there, you're the messenger. It's not about you, it's about the message to present. And, and what we believe in the audience is not what we hear, it's what we see. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Evaluation by Tony is the best French cream de la cream I ever <coughs> read about. Our next evaluator will be Rajiv. Hello, John. My favorite creatures. I can really tell why they're your favorite creatures. At Evening Stars, we're all perfectionists. So in that tone, I'm going to give you some things you did really well, but also ways you can improve on those even further. Let's start off with the opening. 
the goal of your speech was to organize your speech, and your opening was very well organized. It was simple. Like uh, someone else mentioned, you said exactly what the speech was going to be about. You set us in the right mood, in the frame of mind. What I would suggest is having a little bit more suspense in the opening. Think about the mm. stories you told us. You talked about the elephant seal that goes deeper than any man has ever gone before. You talked about butterflies that travel thousands of miles, even though they're dying while in the journey. Bring this into the opening. Get us hooked right then and there. Another thing I really liked about your speech, and I kind of alluded to this earlier, you had some really great stories. I'll be, the big, I'll be the first person to admit I'm not the biggest biology fan out there. I get a little bit bored when I hear about animals described in a scientific way. But you really brought them to life. You told me why these animals were amazing, and you brought these stories to life, and you got my attention that way. What I would suggest is to match your delivery and your body energy to match how exciting these animals are. Bring more energy into it. When you talk about how these animals are doing something so amazing, make us feel that way with your voice, with your vocal variety. I also want to say that the photos that you brought up there when you held it up, it brought it to life. I don't know what a monarch butterfly looks like. I don't know what an elephant seal looks like. But holding it up there gave me something to latch onto, gave me something to visualize. One thing I felt you could have done, though, was to, after showing it to everyone, maybe put it down. Because I really felt like your hand gestures were pretty cramped. Mm -hmm. You were holding it with both hands a lot of the time, and that prevented you from really expanding your arms and pointing and making a lot more gestures that I know you're very capable of. Overall, I got to say, the goal of your speech was organizing your speech, and you did that fantastically. You had a very good opening that set the tone, the body was impeccably organized, and the ending really gave us something to think about and look forward to. Thank you. John, thank you so much for your speech. Thank the only you, question I have, if you had a chance to hear all the evaluators before you deliver a speech, what would you have done differently? I would have focused on finding a way to mount the pictures right away, so to qualify what you said, to be able to have a lot more freedom. It did, to have the pictures and be able to demonstrate them for this setting kept me from being able to just easily put them down, and it probably slowed down and cramped my ability to be as expressive as you are used to me being. Otherwise, I kept it mostly the same. A few changes. Thank you, John. Thank you, Svetlana. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Do you know that District 4 plans to have the competition in Tall Tales? If you have no idea about what, it, what it's all about, you're about to hear the Tall Tale by Birgit. The title of her speech, All Aboard! Birgit. Thank you. The winter of 1993. I was on a consulting project in Connecticut. Now, what does that mean? It meant that every morning, on Mondays, I would fly to Connecticut from Washington, where I live, and then every Friday, I would fly back. Wouldn't you know it? Fridays was always the day of the winter storm. Let me take you back to one particular winter storm day. I was awakened at 6.30 in the morning by my manager in the hotel on the phone. And I was thinking, did I miss a meeting or something? Oh, no. They'd already canceled every single flight of the airport. Great. So we're all going to meet at the train station at 9.30 so that we could try to catch a 10 o'clock flight. First of all, it took about an hour to get a cab. After we finally piled into the cab, seven people in one cab, we were breaking all sorts of laws. We finally get to the train station, and then we have 200 people already there waiting for, waiting for the train. And we're thinking, <laughs> how on earth are we going to get on this, uh, on this train? We ended up jockeying for position. The train started coming in. We jockeyed for position so we could be right in front of the door. And we elbowed our way in. Unfortunately, there isn't a single seat left on that particular train. Great. People started sitting on each other's laps. So every seat had two people sitting on each other's laps. Some people got to know each other probably for the first time. Mm -hmm. And the rest of us were standing in the aisle, just holding on, just hoping that somebody was going to finally get off the train. Well, every five minutes we would stop. Didn't even see a train station. It was storming so hard. It looked like it was just a platform. And one or two people would go out, and more people would jockey around and sit on somebody else's lap. We finally made it to Stanford, Connecticut. And we had the announcement that we were going to have to wait for the locomotive from New York City. Great. 
This was in the days before cell phones. So we were playing solitaire. One colleague at a time would run down their machine with solitaire. After 12 hours and four laptops draining all of their battery, we finally got to New York, finally. And then all of a sudden, they made the announcement, we're going to wait here until we get some other connecting passengers. My friend Tracy, at this point, completely lost it. She said, we're 16 hours late. If they're not here by now, they're not going to be. And guess what? Magically, the train started to move. Madam Toastmaster. Thank you. Everybody is a star at Evening Stars. I hope you had a chance to see how we support each other, how we challenge each other, and if you would like to see more of Evening Stars, go and visit us at um, uh, our website. You could find us on uh, d4tm.org, and if you are you're interested to learn more about Tall Tales and other events organized by District 4, please go to d4tm.org. If you would like to learn more about Toastmasters, go to toastmastersinternational.org. And I promise, you will stay with this organization forever. <laughs> At Evening Stars, uh, we love guests. And we meet every first and third Friday at 6 p.m in Schwab's building, and that building is located at 215 Fremont. Please do not hesitate to schedule um, your first visit to Evening Stars, and we will share everything we know about Toastmasters, and we will help you to grow. Thank you. <laughs>